the glory of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Well, if any of you happen to go look at my office walls, you'll notice I haven't yet hung up my diplomas or ordination certificates, because for a year I've been saying, well, one day things will slow down, and I'll finally... (laughs) rearrange the furniture in here and I, well I don't want to hang them up before I figure out where the furniture's going to go and well I might even repaint in the process so we'll, you know, we'll see with our curate beginning in a week and a half and a little bit of office shifting in the process that's finally going to happen at least the reconfiguring bit and, and when I do I'll go through the different framed things and I'll I'll see a diploma that says I hold a master of divinity degree the standard seminary degree that's earned by ministers of many denominations. And there's a running joke at seminary graduations about having mastered divinity and yet not having the first intelligent thing to say about it. (laughs) Regardless of degree or position, lay or ordained, baptized five minutes or having perfect Sunday attendance for 80 years, none of us can fully grasp or control, or master, a complete understanding of who God is and how God works. God is infinite, so there is always more to be considered. God is incomprehensible to those of us who are finite, and that is good news. Because if we were actually able to totally comprehend all of who God is in God's very own nature... Well, then we would be greater even than God, and we'd have the ability to put God in this box. And then it would seem we somehow had an even more infinite knowledge than the God who has infinite knowledge. God, then, if we were able to put God in a little box, how could God then be the gracious, merciful, benevolent, loving, and even humble Lord and King of the universe that would create the world and also save it. If we were greater than God, we would have to be fighting to save ourselves. The good news is we don't have to. We don't even have to fight over control of who possesses the most knowledge of God. But just because we're finite people doesn't mean we haven't tried. So a few months ago, I was at the barber shop and As I was thinking about it, this might be the third or fourth barbershop story I've told from this pulpit in a year. Um, But anyway, I was getting my hair cut a few months ago, and room full of a few other barbers and a few other clients, and they're all about the same age as me, and several of them go to the same Bible study. I think some of them go to the same church, so they they kind of know each other and have this ongoing theological discussion. And these guys were talking about all the recent videos they had watched on YouTube of um, these various reformed apologists, these folks who like to make seemingly conclusive arguments based on based in scripture, defending nearly any position you give them, this or that or the other, they can find a way to make, uh, make scripture support their position. So the barbershop was full of these guys who were rehearsing their various argumentative points because that's what people do in a barber shop, I suppose. And one of them even mentions that he had just purchased tickets to go to Texas to see this ultimate showdown match between this well-known Reformed apologist and this well-known Roman Catholic apologist who were going to have this huge debate over some, some aspect of the Bible. And these guys were talking about it and using language that really sounded like a wrestling match, more like a cage match or even fight to the death. And they were talking about how, I think it was in Houston, they were driving 13 hours to get there, but there were people flying in from all around the country just to see what was sure to be this all-out brawl. And one would defeat the other. They would smash, or I remember the word obliterate being used. They would, the winner would send the loser home with his tail between his legs in sorrow for being totally wrong, and the winner would then be celebrated for being totally right. To be honest, it made me quite sick to my stomach, and I was glad when my barber said, Oh, Father Isaac, we know you're a pastor. What do you think about all this? <laughs> 
Mm, it's a short, very short conversation from that point. Well, taking quite a different approach, Nicodemus came to Jesus under the cover of night. Nicodemus had been a prominent leader of the Jews. He was a Pharisee. He was a rabbi of the most rigorous training. He was able to argue the finer points of scriptures with authority. In many ways, he was like these apologists I just mentioned, preparing for a cage match. But Nicodemus came to Jesus. He recognized that Jesus was a teacher, as we heard, who'd come directly from God. And he was astounded that Jesus had an entirely different framework, an entirely different foundation and way of thinking and understanding the basis of their faith. In fact, everything they knew of God. Jesus, having come from heaven and knowing one day he would ascend to heaven again, he talked about the kingdom of God and how no one can see it without being born from above. Now, Nicodemus was wise, he was logical, he knew how to ask questions. He said, well, no one can be born again. He knew that didn't make sense in his understanding of the world. Jesus answered, very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. And he goes on to talk about how the wind comes and goes as it pleases And we hear the sound of it, but we don't know where it started or where it stops. Kind of like the infinite God, who is always greater than we imagine. Far beyond where we think we could go to find the ends of God. Nicodemus was astounded. And so Jesus asked, are you a teacher of Israel? And yet you do not understand these things? This well-respected leader was one who seemed to know everything, didn't even know God, perhaps, was more infinite than he could imagine. Now, as I said before, none of us can totally comprehend God. None of us can find God's limits, where God begins or ends, because God doesn't have them. God's infinite. No lifetime spent studying every letter of the scripture and practicing every argumentative defense can definitely to define, to make finite, exactly who God is and exactly how God works. It's a mystery. God is a mystery. But God's also the kind of mystery worth contemplating. God's not the kind of mystery one might solve, like playing a game of Clue to discover it was Colonel Mustard with a bat in the library, or that God is some kind of mystery so we just throw our hands up and not even try to figure it out. But on this feast of the Holy Trinity and every day of the year, we who have been born from above are called to consider who God the Trinity is, how God the Trinity works. We'll never condense God's three-in-one and one-in-three formula down to some scientific equation, but God the Holy Trinity has revealed the very nature of who God the Holy Trinity is. And that nature is love. God is the love of the Father and the Son and the unity of the Holy Spirit. God is a perfect communion of three distinct persons, but so profoundly intimate with one another as to be essentially inseparable. They're of the same essence. None of them acts without all of them acting. None of them existed before the others, none's greater or less. They're all co-equal, co-eternal. The union of the three distinct persons in one trinity is the most sacred mystery. One that we all are called to contemplate and to consider and to follow. And since none of us can put God in a box and claim mastery, not even as we heard from the prophet Isaiah who saw God on the throne and could only talk about the hem of his robe, None of us, none of us can claim and put God in a box definitively and then discuss and consider how God must be in a winner-take-all style debate. Now, we can sure have a conversation. We can sure challenge each other to think about ways of who God is and how God works in a loving and faithful way that builds one another up in faithfulness, not tearing each other down. 
Contemplating God is something we're all called to do humbly, acknowledging that none of us have God entirely figured out. What Jesus calls Nicodemus to, and what God calls us to, is an invitation to live into that divine love between the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Jesus calls any who want to know God to be born from above by water and the Spirit. We're called to be baptized into Christ's body. As St. Paul put it in the epistle to the Romans, we're called not to live according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For when we are baptized, we are adopted. We're adopted into the household of God and brought into the family. We're made co-heirs with Christ, or as the way I think about it from a hymn I grew up singing, we're joint heirs with Jesus as we travel this sod. Because when we're born from above, not born just of the flesh, of the things below, but when we're born by water and the Spirit, when we've been adopted, we've been given the Spirit of love, love that can call us, call us to follow God, call us to know that we are children of God, that we can cry out and say, Abba, Father, Dad, all of us, all from distinct backgrounds and with distinct personalities and viewpoints, from here, there, and everywhere across time and space. If the three distinct persons of the Trinity are in fact actually different from one another, and because they're different, able to then be united, then we too who are all different from one another, distinct in seemingly every way, can be united as equals. When we have diversity of opinion or way of understanding the scriptures or talking about who God is, we can do so with love and compassion and respect. Build one another up in the unity of the faith as equal children of God. Because that's who we all are. We are children of God, children who are called to play and learn together, not to school each other or to win out in a cage match. We're children of eternal life, serving the God who so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him might not perish but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. As the children of God who is love, the love between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit that so spills out into love even us finite humans in the midst of creation, then we children are call, of God are called to be ones who love one another deeply, such that that love spills out into the world that sends us out to proclaim God's love for everyone and to invite everyone into the fold. So may we live into the mystery of God's abundant love. Amen.